Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Taryn Urquhart, and I'm the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. On behalf of the library and the West Vancouver Art Museum, I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's art talk, Douglas Copeland in conversation with Hilary Lefwin. While I recognize that we are all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge that the West Vancouver Library and Art Museum reside within the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their historic connection to the lands and waters around us since time immemorial. I am personally grateful to call the Pacific Northwest my home, and I'm thankful to the Coast Salish communities that continue to protect the natural beauty and animal diversity that surround me every day. It has been my great pleasure to work with Hillary and her guest tonight to bring this event to our community. And now I would like to pass things over to Hillary, who is waiting for us over at the museum. Have a great night. Thank you very much, Taryn. We are so delighted to be presenting our artist talk with Douglas Copeland this evening here at the West Vancouver Art Museum. We are sitting in our exhibition, Rabbit Lane, uh, which is a project that we've been working on for the last two years. Uh, and the exhibition, of course, is on here at the West Vancouver Art Museum until May 28th. Uh, so, Doug, welcome. Oh, thanks, Harry. Nice to be here. It's so nice to be able to get together and to reflect on this project that we've been building yeah. for the last little while. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how the project came about and then we'll shift gears and speak a little bit about the book. Okay. So uh, we started working together uh, because I had sent you an email and said, we'd like to work with you here at the West Vancouver Art Museum. Yeah. And you very kindly got together with me and started to talk about what a project here would look like. Uh, so, in our initial conversations, we spoke a lot about how West Vancouver, the place, influences your writing and influences your art. So, what, uh, what about Girlfriend in a Coma appealed to you for this particular project? Oh. Boy, I, I think it has to do a lot with the relationship we have with both time and with history. And at what point does something that is old become history? What do we choose to forget and not include as history? And, and what, you know, by happenstance or accident somehow slips through the cracks and actually does become history. And the book, uh, the show is based on Girlfriend in the Coma. It was written in 97. And it's set in this little neighborhood of the British properties in the very west, easternmost edge, uh, Rabbit Lane. And by sort of a geographical accident, um, it's right up against Capletto Canyon on one end and this big empty golf course on the other. And I use the expression, it's as though time stood still back in 1966, and they just put a bell jar on top of it, and it never changed. And I've met so many people since, and said, oh my God, you noticed that about that place too. And so in the book, you have characters who graduate from high school in 78, and then one of them, uh, Karen, goes into a coma for two decades, and then she emerges. and. And that's where the discussion about time and history begins. What does she remember? What, what's shocking? What's not shocking? And then, through a sort of metaphysical catastrophe, time itself ends. And then, so what happens when you're living outside of time? And, you know, what happens in a... Which is essentially a world without consequences, really. And so, Maybe you've actually been ha inhabiting real time as if there's no consequences as well. Well, you know, shape up, and maybe you have to renegotiate your relationship with being alive in the world. And I think that's ultimately uh, the story of the book and the show in, in turn. So uh, we set about to stage these scenes from the book, or from In a Coma, uh, and uh, you had the brilliant idea 
of crowdsourcing our cast members and our cars and our homes that we use. Uh, you've, you've done a bit of crowdsourcing before for government, for example, and some of your other projects. Um, what, what about this particular project did you think would appeal to all of the very generous people who got involved in the project? Hmm. I, I think that if you look at the images in the show, you'll see that we have the characters who inhabit the photographs, but the photographs themselves happen inside and outside of this form of architecture that most of us here grew up in, which I guess technically comes out of five and ten dollar blueprints supplied by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, they don't do house tours of CMHC homes in West Vancouver. They're just very homely and drab. But the people who responded to the call for volunteers, almost to a one, grew up inside these houses. They instinctively understood what I was talking about uh, in terms of the sense of time, standing still, compressing, shrinking, uh, in and around these places. And I think they wanted to help commemorate that part of history because I don't think it's ever actually been... I've looked at museums across the country and I've never seen this sort of house celebrated or acknowledged even. So um, I would say that pretty much everyone that volunteered is from and of the environments that we were working in. Well, and certainly of the people that I spoke to over the course of the photo shoots, uh, the idea of there being a sort of worldwide plague or pandemic that, that leads to everybody's death, except of course for this group of friends. I think people found the idea of a pandemic because we were in a pandemic when we were doing mm -hmm. this project. I think they perhaps found that quite appealing as well. Well, the project began shortly before COVID. Uh, the film production company uh, that owns the rights to Girlfriend in a Coma, uh, they contacted my agent and said, like, oh, we're, we're pleading force measure. Like, we, we, uh, like, we can't make this movie because real life is eclipsed it. We could, and we could, never, <laughs> we could never make it. And I think, Maybe that's just them being cheap bastards or whatever. But it was this sort of, you know, the book when we began seemed fantastical. And then as real history in real time went on, it became not really fantastical at all. And, and the things that were really been bizarre two and a half years ago were quotidianized to an almost amazing, an amazing level. So we, we we flipped out on that vibe, that special. <laughs> and, it, and it was remarkable uh, how uh, excited people were to be involved in the project. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, so everything in the photos uh, has, been, has been borrowed and loaned, uh, including the cars and the costumes and yeah. the houses themselves. And that, to me, is really a remarkable part of this project. It, 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 um, the people would ask, you know, what do I wear, of course? And well, just sort of, um, you know, you're going to the same one, it's 1998. And people brought like five or six alternatives, some people brought ten. And, and then we had these informal polls of, okay, what looks most 98? And that it was so democratic. Um, just, I mean, I've been on a lot of union shoots and and they were just sitting there waiting with overtime so they could rack up the dough. And, and everyone here was just dawdling, just trying to extend the happiness of the experience. And then we have a few of the characters, um, uh, Maya and Gemma and Scott, who were in a lot of the photos. And they became sort of like Warhol superstars throughout <laughs> the shoot. And at the opening, it was really lovely to see them. And it felt like a family reunion. It has been really fun to see the cast members come in and see the photos because, of course, they they saw a very rough version of, of each photograph on the day of the shoot. We, we showed them like the sort of the very rough version, and, and uh, 
and then as they come in uh, to see the photos, a lot of them in, in taking photos of themselves in front of the photos, and uh, it's uh, it's it's had a really neat aspect to this particular project. I think this would be just a very good time to point out that the, the photos themselves, although they're printed seemingly largely here, we're filmed using six high definite definition cameras by a, a cameraman and a photographer, Blaine Campbell, who did a superb job of knitting it all together. Uh, the images are ultra high definition and a lot of the appeal comes from that. But I, I think the structure of the, the, the top photographs owes a lot to, I would say, classical painting. Uh, yeah, the people in the shots, uh, they would say, how do I pose, what do I do? And I think we've all watched so many movies and cartoons and TV shows where there's a wind machine going and there's someone saying, you know, make love to the camera. And instead we were saying, well, you know, the, uh, the Last Supper, you know, everyone's sort of in relationship to everyone else. Try and let's go for that kind of look. And it translated seamlessly. I, I don't think there's one person who didn't understand what we were saying. And so it was nice, you know, we we're talking about time and history that, you know, suddenly you're bringing the 16th century into the equation. And, uh, and then in the moment you said painting, or we said painting, people suddenly realized that they were a part of something, a time stream outside of just the here and now that would, would actually linger on. That was kind of, that was magical. That was that was a really cool feature of the yeah. of the posing, and of course, all of the um, models had to hold that pose for thirty to fifty seconds, right? Which is quite a long time to try and sit in one place. Oh, uh, I, I was watching this Seth MacFarlane comedy, A Million Ways to Die in the West, a, a, week, a week ago, and a running joke in the movie is like, you hear this guy, there's this guy in Texas who actually smiled for thirty seconds. <laughs> And it became sort of the, the, uh, the selfie of 1856 or something <laughs> like that. And very few of our models were able to hold that smile for that period of time. It, we had a few, but most people found it a challenge to hold that particular It's smile. really hard. <laughs> I couldn't do this. So they, not only were our models generous with their time, but they were also extremely patient while we captured the images. Uh, and, uh, and and that was that was yeah the, the the classical painting references I think were really important because as you say they they bring us into a discussion about time and these sort of character prototypes um, but they also gave our models who were not actual models with one exception uh, an idea of what we were looking for what we were yeah. looking for I, mean, I, I I will say that this week maybe it's just because it's spring and everything's sort of bouncing back to life. Um, that, you know, I'm 60 now, and the world's going to go on with or without me, and it's very, very humbling. Right? Park Royal's still going to be there in 100 years, likely, and she like, who knows what, how long we'll be there for. It's like, oh, I really was just passing through here. And I think there's this sort of assumption that comes with modernist thinking that um, somehow you'll go on forever, but you don't. And um, maybe it's you know, a, a weird self-reflective day, but I'm, I'm feeling very mortal today, I think. <laughs> and uh, these pictures make me feel, sort of feel like a band-aid for that. Okay, I see you. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's changed since you wrote the book, because it mm. is it is coming up on 25 years, and I, I get the sense that, that uh, there are some things that have changed since you wrote it. I'm remembering back to 1998, and I've always tried to set my books in what I call the extreme present. Uh, and when I began writing, which is going back, 30, 30 something years ago now, uh, everyone said, oh, your, your books will just go dated. And, and what's happened now is each of them has just become a, a really 
hermetically sealed time capsule of the era that they're from. In 1998 was no existence. I think back then you had a very nascent internet that had yet to become malignant. Uh, you had no smartphone technology. Uh, uh, you were actually still, we were living inside of Francis Fukuyama's, you know, end state liberal democracy Fantasia. And uh, we sort of, you know, 9-11 and we've been on a roller coaster ever since. Uh, there was a kind of purity and an innocence about the 90s that uh, I think is never going to come back. I call it the last good decade. <laughs> and uh, I was at the opening of the Mall of America in uh, Minnesota, Bloomington, Minnesota, I think it was. And it was the opening day. And it might as well have been the 19th century. I was up on this podium with the local WKBC radio station. The 4-H club was like awarding prizes to chickens. And there's this roller coaster that was coming every 62 seconds and roaring <laughs> within like three feet of our ears. And, and, uh, and there's all these people walking around and eating ice cream. And the guy from the radio station looked at me and sort of misjudged me and thought, well, Mr. Smarty Pants, you must think this is all pretty silly. And I said, not in the least bit, not the least bit. I think that in a hundred years, we're going to look back on an event like today as some sort of charmed and magical period that can never ever come back, a time of almost ultimate peace and prosperity and uh, friendliness. And, and his reaction was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Left him speechless. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's also the 90s. And uh, you had these characters that were, I think, inhabiting a political vacuum, certainly an ideological vacuum, uh, moral vacuum, uh, again, coming back to the bell jar and the nothingness of it. And uh, uh, I, I think actually, in just looking back on the book, reading, I haven't read the whole thing, it, it's quite hard to reread something. <laughs> like that. Uh, but in the book, the characters, they have motorcycles and they get around quite easily uh, from here and there. But I realized that what we've learned, trees don't fall down very easily and they block roads instantly. And once the trees down over a road, certainly these characters are too lazy to go and they get a chainsaw. So they, I realized in retrospect, they probably would have been confined much more into one neighborhood. They would have had the agency to go around and see the world, but literary license, I suppose. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about the scenes that, that we staged in the photographs, mm -hmm. because um, there, there was certainly some logic to the scenes that, that were selected, but there, there are some surprises as well. Uh, so the scenes generally are, are moments of drama in the narrative. Uh, but we also had some considerations around the expense and the feasibility of certain certain shots. Um, we definitely wanted to avoid gore. Uh, at least I wanted to avoid gore, <laughs> and we could have gone. I know, I this. know, right, grudgingly. <laughs> okay. We, because there, there certainly are moments in the book that that um, the leakers, for example, the bodies of people yeah. who, who died, which are all over the place in the in the last part of the book. Um, so we, we avoided those overt signs of blood and guts and gore and really went to um, scenes where we could insert that sense of doom, that sense of ominousness, and, and certainly some of the photos have that. So um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what your criteria were for picking the scenes that you did. I think I was looking for charged moments uh, throughout the book, or taking moments that had some charge and amplifying that sense of drama. Um, some of the photographs don't map onto exact events inside the book, but they're suggested by certainly. I, I think that, for example, you have. Uh, the character Pam, who is in the photo with uh, the baked beans on the floor, 
She's wearing a, a, a macrame jumpsuit. Highly stems directly from Man Margaret in the, the movie Tommy. Um, in the 70s, there, and I'm just old enough to remember a certain kind of decadence that really no longer exists. And a way, uh, I think, what is decadence? It's an abuse of responsibility. And I, I think that these characters certainly embody that. And I think that when she's in the baked beans spreading down the doom, there's something decadent in the, the photograph to your right. Uh, there's a sale that's going on, which happens in the book. Um, but there are like three large size boxes of Fruit Loops on the floor. And, and I think, in one sense, with the photograph, you're, you're, I would really like everyone who's not seen the book just come into these photographs and say, what the hell is going on here? Like, I need to know <laughs> what, what is happening. Um, I, I, I think, so, I mean, there's this world that we all live in called the real world. Yay, real world. And, and there is this other world that is hidden inside all of us. I was thinking of like Rilke, who's certainly my favorite poet. Um, you know, that each of us has a letter inside of us that is, lies in wait to be opened. And I, I think that the photographs here, they, they all inhabit some moment in time when the letters are being opened and you're actually seeing something that lies inside of all of us. Um, I, the thing I don't understand, Hillary, is why is it so hard to know yourself? Mm. I mean, you're you, you're inside your body, I'm me, I'm inside my body. Like, why can't I access what's really going on in here? You know, maybe people do therapy. It's really, really expensive. It's like going to Antarctica. It's incredibly expensive. And when you get there, there might not actually be anything. And so, I think maybe what art does, or what art tries to do, is just let you like open and just see inside a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe something that's there that's very, very hard to access, and maybe it's for the common good that we all don't know too much about ourselves. <laughs> so, so that actually um, is a fantastic way to express what a lot of our visitors have been expressing when they've come in to see the photographs. And I'm thinking in particular about one image, 5.30 a.m. grad night. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in that image, we've got the, the two young high school students who just had their grad night in these amazing 1970s tuxes, ruffled shirts, orange and blue tuxes. They, they are a sight to behold. Uh, and uh, that particular photo from the series elicits uh, the, the most significant response from visitors because they're, I think they just get walloped by this sense of nostalgia when mm -hmm. they look at it. Uh, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me that that's the photo that, that people immediately gravitate towards. Is that something? Uh, more, more than the beans, which in my mind is even more dramatic. Okay, okay. <laughs> so um, let's talk about nostalgia for a minute and, mm -hmm. and how uh, you know, circling back to your childhood here in West Vancouver, uh, this is this is a hyper local project for you. It's a very personal project for you. Um, did did you get a great sense of nostalgia as you were working on this particular project? Uh, first of all, I'll say that the the blue uh, tux in that photo is identical to the one I wore, and that the two teenage guys who modeled for the shot. They just looked at these wigs as like, seriously? The, the feathered hair. And, and the, you have to understand that every single guy on earth had that hair. Mm -hmm. like, and, every, and every girl on earth had either the Farrah or the Dorothy Hamill bun cut. And that was it. Those were the only <laughs> options you had. Um, I didn't think of it as nostalgia. I thought of it as historical accuracy mm. um, and, and just getting it right. I mean, even down to something like the license plates, which we had to research to make sure that they, they were in fact authentic. Um, and it, it's, I guess what's changed between then and now, I mean, to look at some of these interiors, 
you don't look that different from right now, except in if it was right now, there would be something somewhere with a little tiny LED light blinking somewhere, or there would be a lot more cords somewhere down near the floor. Um, there, there's this idea that I've been thinking about, and and then I've been talking about it, uh, some friends who work in museums and futurology and that sort of thing, and uh, what if there is no next big thing? And what do you mean, Doug? Well, okay, we've had search, uh, we've had uh, all forms of digital communication, uh, we've had the way that those ideas play out with things like Uber or PayPal or what have you, or, you know, 23 and me being used to sign or to solve murder cold cases, etc. But what if there actually is no next big new technology coming down the pipe? And then I don't even think this idea has a name yet, so I'm trying to find one for it. But then what does that mean? It means that the technology we have right now is possibly all that we're stuck with, all, mm -hmm. we're, all we're going to get. And, and this can fork out a number of ways. Number one is like, but wait, we're so used to having these idiots in Palo Alto throwing something new at us every <laughs> 18 months. And apparently it'll be another decade before we get another big thing thrown at us. And then it'll only come about uh, as a result of AI. Mm -hmm. So like it or not, we're sort of trapped in this, mm -hmm. uh, 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 I wanna say rat maze, I mean, something like, Visante or something. We're, 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 what we have is all we're going to get in the next decade until we uh, change things again. And so, you know, what will your living room look like in 12 years? What will mine look like? It probably won't look very different except for, you know, right now it's a blinking LED. It could be one little wire that comes down from a corner that's on the present. Uh, uh, we, in Vancouver, a big surprising thing between now and then will be all the water and air conditioners. Two things that you would never have seen in a house back in 78 or 98. Yeah. And, and so things change, but they don't change. Mm -hmm. There's this one photo, it's in this kitchen in this house in North Vancouver, which Remember, you and I were scouting out this other house, and then we're like, hold the bone, what is that? <laughs> and it was a really seminal post and game from 1958. Yeah. And, and you called the owners by the contractor's sign, and they said, go on in, do what you want to do. And what, what a score that was. So we went in, and there was this kitchen. And in 1958, it was the most modern kitchen like, in Canada. And, but then the original owners, they put that kitchen in and then they said to themselves, well, that's it. We're never gonna change this kitchen ever again. And they didn't. And then you walked in and it felt like you were entering like an actual time capsule of some sort. And, and because at that point, it, we were still scouting it out. We felt like we were in someone else's house, or we mm. felt like we were in a sort of sacred spot. And uh, and I think that of all the shots, that's the one we just did. We have to do something here. Yes. And so we took the picture I had of uh, Neil Armstrong and put it in. And it just sort of speaks for itself, really. And then, of course, coming in the window at the top, its top left corner is this great big. Uh, being like 20 something, you know, 2019 or something else. I, I, I love that photo and I love the, the sort of um, the, the happy circumstance of the way that whole photo came about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, we, we did do a great deal of planning for the shots and making sure that we had the right props and the right people and the right costumes and the right cars. But there were always those accidental moments that I think 
uh, also shine through in the series, and, and certainly that is one of my favorite instances. I also love um, the Cleveland Dam shot that we did, which was the very last shot that we did in the series. And if I remember correctly, we, we shot that in October. So we did most of the shoots uh, in August, and we waited until October to do Cleveland Dam because we needed it to be dark enough, and we didn't want it to be 10.30 at night. Yeah. Uh, so um, Cleveland Dam is is a place near and dear to your heart. Do you want to talk a little bit about that particular image? Well, well, I grew up from kindergarten right through to grade 12, just right up above the dam. It, it was never more than six-minute walk away. And the thing about the British properties is that there's never been any retail allowed. And I don't know why, because it's, it's, it's... Growing up, if you, you know, lived up there, you had to get some butter, you had to get a large American automobile with gasoline, go right down to sea level and go all the way back up. And it, it, it is an ecological travesty, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, until you get your driver's license, it's, essentially rural. I mean, you are in the middle of nowhere. So my only experience with retail growing up was Hardy's Grocery Store, which you had to go down to the dam and across. <laughs> and to this in, day... In North Bend. In North Bend, yeah. yeah. But to this day, I still can't believe you walk into this place called a store and you give them this stuff called money and they give you things. It, it's, <laughs> it, it's magic. Astonishing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, we, I know every square inch of the forest down there, uh, that's where I want my ashes scattered, uh, you know, should I get hit by a bus tomorrow, uh, the canyon, oh my god, the, I'm so glad there was no social media back then, <laughs> oh god, I know. Did you get any system trouble there? <laughs> well, my poor parents, they, I had three brothers, and... My two older brothers, especially, were hell on wheels. And, <laughs> you know, it, here's something else to remember. North Vancouver and West Vancouver, back in the 50s and 60s, um, there was this caricature of West Vancouver and the British properties as being Martini Hill. And those people had no idea that every house up there was basically some young family's first mortgage ever. Mm -hmm. And people back then had three, four, five kids. Uh, it was just like, like Central Ireland before the potato famine. There were just like kids everywhere crawling over and under and into things. And, uh, and there was an actual sense of community. And I, I'm one of those people that keeps in touch with people, albeit not by Facebook, which I don't like or approve of. But um, it was a nice time to grow up there. And, to drive through it now, I think it's been through several different iterations since the time I grew up there. I, mean, I, I think now if you drive up, especially through the properties, it's completely hollowed out uh, socially. There, there's zero sense community. Uh, half the houses are empty. A large number that were derelict. Who knows who owns them or you know, when they're going to get torn down. Um, it has, weirdly, I read this in the North Shore and it was the, uh, the highest rate of social dysfunction of kids going to school. Mm. Uh, in a lot of cases, the kid families just dump the kid there mm. and they don't even go to school. They just play video games and eat ramen noodles in the basement and then they really can't function in the real world. Um, so the disconnect between then and now is really something as well. All those trees that were planted back in 1964 are now, you know, a hundred and something tower. feet tall. They tower mm -hmm. on the summer roads like Barnum or Cross Creek or Highland. They completely make a tunnel over the road. And in a weird way, the whole property is just turning into a form of Rabbit Lane. Mm -hmm. um, Rabbit Lane itself seems to tick along. You know, there's a few monster places going in down there, but it still has that air of charged boredom. Um, in one of the photos, there's the Yeti, who's made out of videotape. And we, uh, we just went about a videotape and, and the blue guy didn't tape it on. 
We had no idea how successful it was going to be. <laughs> and to, uh, and we, it was put on top of an old brown UPS postal outfit uh, jumpsuit. And Jay, who works here at the museum, she volunteered to put it on. And holy crap, it is terrifying. <laughs> like, and dogs freak out. And, like the dogs would freak out when they I saw think, it. I think it was your Halloween costume. It year. became my Halloween costume. <laughs> and um, so, but growing up, there was always the Yeti or the, the Sasquatch mm -hmm. out in the Capilano Canyon somewhere, or maybe up in the uh, uh, up in the watershed or up in the Hollywood Mountain, and you know, who was the Yeti? What was the Yeti? You know, it must be very lonely being the Yeti, and you know, uh, maybe he's not evil after all. Bang, and um, yeah, you know, I, I once read that they were going to. Well, the one way to find out if there was a Loch Ness monster for sure was they just like. Electrify all Loch Ness and then like little dead will monsters and pull their tongue. Oh, that's and so I thought that with the Sasquatch, like in a weird way, that what's happened with globalization and sort of our cities and neighborhoods losing their innocence is that somehow all the sort of the Sasquatch is floated to the top. And I, I sort of miss that innocence. So that is nostalgia. I miss what, what used to be there. So. I think this is probably a great time to wrap up our discussion. Uh, from Rilke to Futurology, we've covered a lot, <laughs> uh, and I'm very grateful to you for the chance to have worked with you on this project and to speak with you about it this evening. Well, Hillary, it could never have happened without you. <laughs> so thanks, and you know that. And, uh, and uh, thanks to the library for doing this talk. Uh, the exhibition is open until May 28th. Uh, we are open uh, Tuesday till Saturday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and we are looking forward to seeing you here soon. Thank you.